when I just went to LA, my friend's doing a podcast as well. How did you feature on their show? No, he's interviewing like entrepreneurs. Oh, fair enough. Like yeah. really big ones. Yeah. yeah. And you're an uh, up and coming But I, I was um, helping him with like the post production and everything. Oh, how great. was that? It was so cool. Like he would literally, he's like a small podcast. Yeah. And he's been doing it since March. And he's been interviewing people like the CEO of American Apparel, like really big CEOs. And he's doing really well. Well, that must have been an experience to work on. Yeah, it was really cool. So you're just helping him edit? I was taking photos for him. Cool. And yeah. so you, you've helped with that marketing? <laughs> yeah. Nice. But he's a good friend of mine. Man, like LA and San Francisco is another... It's another dimension, man. Like, yeah. in terms of entrepreneurship and creativity, it's like, pff, yeah, mind-blowing. Yeah, well, you can talk about it in more yeah, detail. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. But anyway, welcome back to the My Generation podcast. This is now the ninth episode, there, and we've been anticipating you, Mike, because we booked this so long ago that I've pretty much punted for this episode every week since, like, the second or third episode. And finally, nine episodes in, we're here. We're here. We're recording this at the end of June. You're not hearing this until probably the first week of August, though, and Mike will have well and truly been back from his trips away to America, which we're going to hear all about. But as I said, on today's show, we're talking about solo traveling. I recently went on my first trip away alone to Brighton and intend to do more of the same. I want to go again, but I don't really know how to expand my horizons on this. So today I thought I'd talk to solo traveling expert, entrepreneur and recent university graduate Michael Hugh about his recent experiences traveling alone and how he's got on. Michael, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Max. No problem. Well, it's, yeah, you've just literally hot off the plane from literally, America. Literally. I literally got back today at 6am and right now it's early in the afternoon, feeling a bit jet lagged, but yeah, it was a 20 day trip to LA and San Francisco and it flew by. It was literally like I left yesterday and I'm back now. So, And who did you go with? I went alone. Completely alone? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And um, so you went all across LA and San Francisco just That's by yourself right. meeting new people. Yeah. So I did that um, in December for 24 days. But uh, the first time I went to America, I went to San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles and Las Vegas. And I fell so in love in this like with the cities in US and the creative spirit and just how much cultural awareness I was going through and just learning. I was like, I need to visit again and I need to sort of explore more. I felt 24 days for that many cities wasn't enough. So this time I went out and I did 20 days. 20 days. And so how how much did you cover? Where, where did you go within the city? So San Francisco, um, I did a bit of couch surfing. Yeah. And what that is, is it's an app and it's like Airbnb um, where you can request to stay with a host, but it's completely free. Um, so I did that and my host took me around the oldest Chinatown in the whole world, wow. which was amazing. And he was based in a financial district. So I was covering all of that. Um, we did some hikes around the city took a lot of pictures and then also went to Los Angeles as well. So I have a friend there who's living in downtown Sotel, which is near UCLA. Okay. Yeah, wow. so Santa Monica near the beach. Yeah. And they're all entrepreneurs, so I was just following them. Not much sightseeing, but I was really in like the midst of how they're doing in terms of their business, like running their business and just... Yeah, it was just a great time. And so this trip, this was more of a, of a work-based trip, but all that mm. sort of couch surfing stuff, that's quite interesting because the big put-off for solo traveling is how are you going to stay somewhere? You spent 20 days. Did you spend that in one person's house or did you go between places? So LA, I spent 10 days and San Francisco, 10 days. And um, Los Angeles, I had a friend there because when I was studying in Hong Kong, I had a roommate. And my roommate was exchanging from UCLA. And since he's graduating and working on his business there, I stayed with him there. Yeah. And San Francisco, um, so I went back in December. I went December and I um, surfed at this guy's house. And we got along so well. Yeah. That I was like, I'm going to come back again. <laughs> so it was like six months later, I went back to his house. And yeah, it was, it was a good time. Well, and you're making friends along the way. I mean, yeah, for sure. It's, it's networking. But I think for a lot of people, 
the, what makes this story so unique is that the idea of traveling alone, I know when I did, I didn't really interact with too many people. Mine mm. was more of a personal thing. How do you so, turn it into such a social thing, solo traveling? Do you know what? I just think that people are nicer than you expect them to be, honestly. Like, I feel like in our society now, we're sort of afraid to approach people, especially randomers and especially by yourself, that level of discomfort. But since this has been my 28th country, 29th country I've traveled to, I've sort of embraced what people can be like. And I've seen the really good sides of people. And yeah, um, yeah I've kind of disfaced stereotypes of what um, the mass media might think about solo traveling and how it might be a sort of a dangerous thing to do when you're by yourself and no one to look after. So since I've been to so many different places around the world, I feel like I can just be open and I can just be super transparent and smiley and friendly to people and it reciprocates. And I feel like when you're like that and you take that attitude, we're traveling by yourself, you can meet so many people. So yeah. um, when I went to San Francisco, I stayed at that person's place. I didn't know him before. And yeah, we clicked. And because we clicked so well, he took me to his friend's place. We went to his friend's offices. And that's when it expands because once you meet their friends, it just keeps on carrying on. Yeah. And so the couch surfing is the is the focal point of it, though. So you br you bridge out from that person, and they show mm -hmm. you the surrounding area. So I don't know too much about. You said it's an app. Yeah. So people post that you can stay in their room, and that they're going to show you around. And I imagine you've got to be like certified on the app or something. Could you paint a picture for sure. how you'd use it? Yeah. So what couch surfing is? It's a mobile app. So what you do is you sign up, you put all your details in, your age, your location. Um, what you're about, a little profile, a little biography. So I'm like, I'm Mike, I'm 22, I like the gym, I like studying, I like working out, da 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 da. And then you put the countries you've been to and the countries you want to visit and what languages you're fluent at. And when you're requesting to stay at someone's house, you sort of write a little introduction about yourself and why you want to stay there. So pretty much can travel and do it in any country. So um, in San Francisco, for example, there was 100,000 100, hosts. Wow. 100,000. And I know in London, there's over 200,000. So you've got that many people to stay with. And the great thing is, it's it's completely free. So how? It's, so the app's completely free? Yeah. Do you have to pay to stay at the house? So it's completely free. You don't have to pay to stay at the house. The only thing is, is you... To increase your chances of being hosted, you have to pay a small membership fee of £50, but that's lifetime. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that, but it makes you more legit because people see you investing in the app, in yeah. the sort of community. Because couchsurfing is essentially a community. Like, everyone trusts each other because... You need some level of trust for some random to stay at your house, right? Yeah, and I imagine it goes both ways. So you you see someone who you want to mm. stay at. You want to see that they've got a five-star page that everyone's recommended that they're good to stay with. Yeah. And because then both of you feel safe letting each other in. Is that Exactly, the yeah. And um, I forgot to mention, so every time you stay at someone's house, you write a review. Mm. So if you had a bad experience, for example, you could write, oh, Mike... I'm not staying with him again. Yeah. He's this and that. <laughs> Don't recommend him. But if we had a really good time, they could say, like, Michael's this and that, and I would love to host him again. And future hosts can see that, and they'll be like, oh, okay, he's actually a cool person. I would vibe with him. So, yeah, yeah that's how it works. Well, I didn't even know it was through an app, because I wondered about how you solo travel, because you do it so frequently. 20, <laughs> yeah. 29 countries. Uh, the hard question is, if you had to pick three, if you could only oh. go back to three of the places you've been, which three would they be? Um, okay, I really love America, especially the West Coast. So I'd, I would love to go back again. I felt like the 20 days was not enough. Yeah. Um, so America for one. Uh, number two would be the Philippines. That country is absolutely amazing with amazing people. And number three, I would like to go to the Maldives again, but in the capital. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me feel like a one uh, a four day trip to Brighton was nothing in comparison <laughs> to this. No, no, that's not true. Yeah, but that's uh, Maldives. So, could you for the Maldives and for Philippines? Can you paint a picture of what it was like going there? Sure. So, actually, Philippines was my first couch surfing trip. Wow. And that was last year. 
um, I didn't know what to expect, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Um, it was next on my travel list, so I was like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna couch surf, I'm going to see how it is. So I booked the um, ticket to Philippines, and I had nowhere to stay, so I requested this woman called Maria, and she happily accepted me. Yeah. And I was a bit skeptical, it was my first time, I've never stayed in a stranger's house, and she picked me up and got packed to her house. I wouldn't say it was a house, it was a shack in a village in Cebu. So I was a bit skeptical, and yeah, um, yeah it was just in the middle of a, of a village. Yeah. There was no... It wasn't a big town, it wasn't a big city, there wasn't people there, it was just local Filipino people, and I was the only tourist. Wow. And it was a shack, they had no clean water, they had no Wi-Fi, but the thing is, they had two beds, um, they had seven people living in the house, Wow. and it was a really, really great experience because usually when you go to travel you want to think about hotels, you want to think about eating luxury food, about going to really nice places but that was not to sound rude but it's the complete opposite but it was such an enriching fulfilling experience which I'd love to go back again because for me traveling is about learning and it's about being humble by the process and when I was there I was like these people literally have nothing but everything yeah like they're so rich and happy and fulfilled inside by their community but externally they have nothing like it was just like crazy to think that because in our in like Western society we sort of ideate towards like being rich and that's what makes you happy. But I just saw the complete opposite there. Well, it's more of a we're more materialistic, I think, is it? Mm. Which is a subject that we touched on in the second episode with Harry. So I'll yeah. link that below. Um, but obviously, you've gone somewhere else. You've seen a different, completely kind of group of people. What? Why were you in the Philippines in the first place? So it was just it was a bit random actually. Yeah. I I like to feed, go I like to go to different places and I was like, okay. I was studying in Hong Kong at the time last year on my year abroad and I was like, never been to Philippines before. <laughs> I wanna check that out. It's cheap, it's got lovely beaches. Um and that sold me. Oh uh, wow. Yeah. And so that that was what made you take the first step. It was just something you've always wanted to do. Yeah. 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 And so you, your top three, America, Philippines, and, and Maldives. Maldives. Yeah. That's right. And along the way, obviously, it's a more of a networking thing as well, because I spoke to Connor on a recent episode about moving to a new place. Mm. You need something that gets you socially involved. And um, next week, we're going to be talking to Eleanor and how acting helped her integrate into Canterbury. Would you say that the Couchsurfing app, and is there anything else that helped you integrate into a new place quite quickly? Yeah, I would say in terms of traveling and integrating, couch surfing has played a fundamental role in that because you're not staying with a tourist, you're staying with an actual local who's been living there uh, most of their life or for a long period of time. So when you're in that environment, you're just immersed in their livelihood straight away. You're you're waking up when they're waking up, you're eating what they're eating, they're taking you to the actual local places rather than tourist places. And yeah, you get to meet their friends who are also local. And I think that's just a great way of immersing yourself in someone's culture or yeah, someone's life. So, yeah, because it's giving you not just the, the glossy tourist mm. version of a place, which is which has its place in uh, society, you know, having somewhere to go for if you're there for a day or two. But do you think that, what would you recommend for someone who's just starting this? They've just downloaded the app. They're, they're picking their first place. They've never, never done this before. Like you, they're skeptical mm. going into their first time. What would you recommend to someone? Um, so for someone who's never done solo traveling before and is skeptical about couch surfing, what I'd recommend is something like a step below. I would say start at hostels first. Yeah. Because in hostels, you have to share a room with someone. And it's often like four to ten people. And I think that's the stepping stone of sort of taking that brave move and traveling by yourself because you don't know how you'd react in staying in someone's home. So I'd say try a hostel first if you enjoy that and if you can sort of mingle around with the crowd and if you 
are looking for something more than a hostel, then then I would say go for a couch surfing experience. Um, and if you're skeptical, you can tell your parents, tell your friends, turn on the Find My iPhone app or a tracking app, and yeah, just I would just say relax and have fun with it. Um, don't think too much. People are nicer than you think. Yeah. And have you? So have you done hostels before? Quite yeah. Frequently. Yeah. So I started last. Wait, no, it was twenty seventeen. Um, I've I've done hostels in Vietnam, um, over ten cities in China, Taiwan, and yeah, many many more countries. Um, it's it's a great experience because sometimes in when you're rushing to apply for somewhere to stay at a couch surfing host house it doesn't work all the time so for, no. for example this year i went to iceland in april um i requested to stay at a few people's house but because the country is so sparsely populated it was really hard to get hosted yeah and especially with the amount of tourism as well there um so for that i used couch surfing and funnily enough i'm gonna digress a bit um i ask someone to hang out with me because you don't necessarily have to stay with someone in couch surfing you can hang out with people if they put on their itinerary so for example say i'm going to iceland and i'm yeah. like i'm staying for seven days someone can find me and going oh i'm staying there as well do you want to hang out yeah so i found someone um and he was called joe and we actually um we actually got sponsored for a car Wow. We got sponsored by a car company and they gave us a van for seven days. Huh. <laughs> and that was through couch surfing because we were both amateur photographers and we helped this company take photos. Oh, wow. So you went around Iceland taking photos for the company and, and they just they saw you on the app and they were like, hey, have this van, off you go. No, so I met this guy through the app yeah. and we were like, how about we approach this company oh so you approach them direct yeah wow. how about we approach this company and ask if we could get a sponsorship deal yeah. and it worked and it's crazy because i would never think about the idea without joe you know so well you don't ask you don't get as exactly. well exactly yeah so you took it as, as a business opportunity as well which is yeah. very you isn't it because <laughs> <laughs> um because obviously you do quite a lot of entrepreneurial mm -hmm. work and so is that now ingrained in your traveling do you try and not just not it's not just about making money out of the place, but you, you know pushing on your career and being able to actually do more of this traveling is yeah. entrepreneurial skills important? Do you say with travel? I feel like since I've just graduated, I need to think about my life more carefully yeah. <laughs> in terms of not just traveling, but sort of mingling the two, like business and work. To, uh, no business and travel together. Um, it's really played a big role, like traveling. So it's crazy because when I went to San Francisco, I was going to all these networking events. I went to um, a company called Dropbox. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you just meet so many new people. It's it's insane. Like because I most of my work is on e-commerce and online, I felt San Francisco was a very good place to start. And the person I was couch surfing with, he is actually one of my business partners now. Wow. Yeah. So you hadn't even met him before couch surfing. No. And now he's a business partner. Yeah. So after this trip, we've decided to work on something together and he's going to be one of my angel investors. Wow. Um, which is incredible because you think couch surfing and doing business with that yeah. couch surfer is, is that like that crazy yeah. it's very crazy and so is he he's based in america was he the person you surf with or were you both just travelers that met there i was i was i was staying with him wow um but he had a lot of friends who are also in the tech industry and with san francisco being in silicon valley i met so many influential people it was just on another level like you see 21 22 year olds on quarter million a year yeah. on five figures a year on six figures a year and when you're exposed to that many people and when you connect with them, you're like, okay, I've got connections here now. So, for example, when I was in Shanghai and I was traveling, I stayed with a manager who was um, at an e-commerce website, uh, e-commerce startup as well. So I've got her as a connection because that's what I want to venture in at. So yeah. it's good. You know? Yeah, because you're putting yourself in all of the places. Because mm. I think with online and e-commerce stuff, it's quite easy to be like, okay, everyone's on the internet, I can stay at home now, 
because the world's out there and I can reach it from this computer. But there's something about physically meeting them, would mm. you say, and actually interacting with the person face to face because they know you've made the commitment. Yeah, that for sure. Like building rapport is the key to sort of getting a business partner or even trying to not necessarily get a business partner, but to understand the field they're into because you never know in the future what you'll be doing. And when you're connecting with someone on a one-to-one level and building that rapport and connection as friends, then you can get trust much more easily. Yeah. And it's, it's important because with the world being more and more global and where trade is becoming so flexible around the world with technology and just the vast um, improvements in how the infrastructure is in society, it's, it's really important to have these global connections. Yeah, and so there's, you talked about connections being a reason to travel. What other reasons do you think there are for people wanting to start solo traveling? So we've covered the more business aspect of it. Why else do you think that someone might want to consider starting? Yeah, so the reason I started is because it sounds cliche, but I wanted to understand myself more, like how I'd be in different settings. Like you don't really, honestly, I would say I didn't know who I was before because I was always in this safe, controlled environment. I was always going to university, going back home, having dinner with my parents and repeat. And it was just the same because you're in you're in that bubble and you're very comfortable and you're familiar with everything. But when you take yourself out of that bubble and you're immersed in your in a different culture and where you don't know anyone, then you start realize, oh wow, I'm much more different than I think, you know? And it it gives you these challenges as well. So in the Philippines, I felt very uncomfortable at the start. I was like away, like over 5,000 miles away from home. Yeah. I didn't know anyone. They were speaking different languages. They were eating different food. I was like, whoa, I can't take <laughs> this. But you grow from it, you know. You become much more independent. And, and independency you... is a big thing for that. Because I think one of the things that puts me off it, even though I really want to try what you're doing here, um, <laughs> I'm, I don't think I'm very good independently. What would you say to someone like me, a skeptic, because we're, we're scared of the outside world. <laughs> Not scared of it, but, you know, we want to do it, but you need the push. What, mm. what push would you give to someone to say, go do it? I would first ask why you're scared. Mm. So, I just, oh God, now, now the interview's flipped. Now, it's, now mm. I'm the guest. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I think it's one of those things where I'm not too sure. I, I think the brain starts to create excuses. Like, as you've been talking, my excuses. And if, um, if you're also like me, as someone who's quite naturally introvert, introverted, I'm thinking safety. I'm thinking because I've got a peanut allergy food. Uh, I'm thinking connections. Will I be able to form them? Um, What would you recommend to someone with those three skepticisms? And I mean, I really want to push through this. This, Mm. Sell this to me, Mike. Yeah. So I have a very different way of thinking about things. And I feel like in this life, we have a very, very limited amount of time. So if you factor in our seven to eight hours sleep, um, the things we have to do, so shower, brush our teeth, eat, um, transportation. We have very lim- limited amount of time to do things. And I feel like traveling and exploring the world is one of the things we need to do because that's where you learn to grow. Discomfort makes you grow. Yeah. And if you want, for me, I want to better myself every day. Like, I feel like a very driven person. I want to learn things every day. I want to understand everything and I feel like traveling does that for me yeah and for someone like you who's a bit skeptical about if you're safe or not I would say challenge yourself if you want to grow as a person and if you want to sort of open your mindset into new meeting new people and seeing things in a different light I would just say take that challenge and do it yeah I mean we as humans are conditioned to be safe because of thousands of years ago as our, our ancestors were designed to protect ourselves from like other tribes from attacking us. We've still got that ingrained in our brain. And once we try and understand that is not helping us and we detach yeah. ourselves and just take that plunge, it, it helps so much. I can say the same for public speaking. Yeah. My brain was saying, no, you can't do it. It's scary, you're going to get hurt, 
Yeah. But once you take yourself out of that bubble and you take that leap of faith, things change. And it's the same with traveling. Well, I mean, like we, we met through public speaking. I, I think I was in the same boat when I started public speaking. I started this podcast as well, where you have that feeling of, I'm jumping into something new. Can I do it? And with those two, I found it so much easier to burst through that compared to this. I mean, it's part of the reason I chose this topic. I only started out with Brighton, but I loved it. Um, I actually did mine as like a social media detox. So I didn't use my phone for the whole trip either. And I felt I, because I was actually looking at the place around me, I had like a really vivid picture of Brighton. I did some writing about it afterwards just to document what, how I felt the place was. And because I didn't have my phone, I felt like I was learning more about the place than if I had. So um, when you come back from a place, you, so you just come back from San Francisco, is there anything you do to document or reflect on that specific trip? Yeah, so... The things I've learned and the things I've experienced, I always write it down. And I've, when I feel like something hits me, I write it straight on my iPhone. And I always write notes about what I've learned and sort of things I've reflected on as well. So, for example, meeting so many new people in the tech industry, I was like, okay, I literally made a list of what I need to learn in terms of learning about tech and how it's going to affect our lives in the future. And... Um, just following up on the conversations I have with people because each each interaction is like it's just a new path and it's just it's, yeah it's just opening opening up another yeah yeah Cause isn't isn't there that thing where everyone is now only like ten people away from each other in the whole world now exactly which shows how connected we are do you know what was crazy my couch surfing's friend is my best friend's friend oh wow. Yeah. What are the chances? That's insane. <laughs> yeah, and it's other, crazy. other way across the uh, the world. Yeah. Oh, I think the best coincidence I've had of that, I, I run little murder mystery parties, and one of the pictures I used as a graphic, uh, someone who was playing my game came up to me and said, this is my, I think it was their dad. Wow. It, was, it was either their dad, no, it was their brother. It was their brother, and so it kind of broke the immersion for them because one of the characters they were actually related to. It just shows how small the world is. Mm. Oh, so if it, regarding rules, really, then... Um, is there anything culturally that shocked you about a country you've been to? Oh, um, shocked. I think there's been many, you know, cultural differences, but I wouldn't say shocked. I would say sort of humbled in a way and yeah. reduced my ignorance of a place. Um, for example, when I went to Philippines, everyone's like, it's dangerous, it's scary. There's a lot of kidnapping and crime. When I went there, complete opposite. Yeah. Um, Filipino people are the nicest people I've met. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was amazing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't say anything too negative. It's more... No, shock can be yeah, yeah. positive as well. Just something yeah. that you didn't expect to be the way it was. Yeah. So that's a good example. It, it but... just um, detaches from the stereotypes that society sort yeah. of ideates. Yeah. So my mission is actually to travel to every single country in the world. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm totally down for travelling everywhere. Um, Obviously languages, because I imagine language barrier is going to be a thing. Yeah. I can only speak English. W what would you say for someone who's just getting into this and doesn't know another language, mm. what would you recommend? So I'd say um, for most of Europe, you're completely fine. Um, Asia, yeah, it's a bit of a hit and miss for that because um, a lot of... The Asian countries can't really speak English, but for the most part, I think it's okay once you stay in like a youth hostel or um, you've sort of planned your itinerary beforehand, it would be fine. It's just, I would say, just come a bit prepared in sort of cultural differences and what you should understand about a certain country. Yeah. But if you're starting around in Europe or in America or even in Africa, I would say you're fine. Um, but for Asia, I would say do your research. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I was gonna. Next question was gonna be about research. How do you go about planning a trip? So no matter where you're going, obviously there's gonna be steps that you have to plan for. Talk me through maybe one of your recent trips. How you planned for it? Okay. So a recent trip was LA and San Francisco. Didn't plan anything. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for the most part, I don't plan for any of my trips. Really? I lich. The most planning I do is I book the flight. I request a set of someone's house on couch surfing, 
once I'm approved, I go, and then that's that's it. Yeah. Um, because for me, I'm not the way I travel. It's not necessarily going to all the tourist attractions, but immersing myself with a local.、Um, it might be very different to others. I understand that.、Um, but yeah, it's just the way I travel. It's, it's a way where I could be more spontaneous. So San Francisco, I didn't plan anything. I ended up going to a music festival. Yeah.、Um, managed to go to loads of networking events. Managed to go to loads of hikes,、um, dinners, dances,、um, live concerts, comedy shows, and I didn't plan anything. Wow. And I was doing something every day. So, yeah. yeah. And that's yeah, that's really nice. The spontaneity angle of it.、Um, what would you recommend? Because I know a lot of people I know they're in quite fixed routines with their、mm. job. Um, you've got an e-commerce website that gives you quite a flexible schedule.、Mm. Um, what would be the recommendations for someone who's in quite a fixed work schedule to still get this experience? Yeah, so I would say really cons because your time is constrained in a nine to five. I'd say really consider where you want to go, and I'd say pick maybe top five countries, and see how much time you can allocate to yourself. If you really want to travel, I would say do neighboring countries. So I know in Europe, your next Europe, European countries are next to loads of different countries. So I would say you can knock a few down in one go in like a week or something.、Yeah. <laughs> um, and I would say yeah, do your research if you if you've got a fixed schedule.、Um, go on Google Flights is a really good way of finding、uh, cheap flights and. Um, Lonely Planet is really good as well. Lonely Planet. Okay.、Yeah. Well, we're going to get Mike to send all those over to me, and all those links will be in the description, especially to that couchsurfing website. And being in Kent, this is a very Kent-based show, and we're going to talk about local impact in a minute. But you're right on the on the seafront. You're right next to France. It's、yeah. quicker to get to to France from here than it is to get to Manchester or like maybe even Birmingham if you push it. But yes, that's what、uh, Mike and I have had to say so far about solo traveling. But do you have a story to tell us about the subject? Has Mike maybe inspired you to go? If so, feel free to leave us a comment here on YouTube or contact the Facebook page at the My Generation Podcast, and we'll be featuring comments over the next few episodes. So get your thoughts into us. This is the ninth episode. If you've been on a solo travel, or if you're doing so at the minute. Maybe even send in a little audio clip from where you are. Send in a just a you can record it with your iPhone, just a twenty or thirty second update. Say where you are, what inspired you to go. If you are away solo traveling at the moment, anywhere in the world, as we'd love to hear from you, and we'll try and feature those sound bites as they come in. If you're out doing that, so Mike, local impact. Well, usually local impact is a little easier to talk about on this show, but what would you recommend for someone in Kent? Looking to get involved in this specifically, I would say because Kent is a very you know sparsely populated ca- county,、um, I would say take a friend. Yeah, take a friend and just, just, just go. Just yeah, do. Just yeah. go. It's it's one of those things where usually we have something really specific to say about Kent, but now it's like you can go anywhere. Exactly, it doesn't even matter at this point. But、um, yeah, you've got Eurostar and things. If you, I mean Eurostar is quite an expensive one, but you've got a lot of ways of getting around. I guess my my question regarding local impact will more come from traveling from home to these locations.、Yeah. Um, you said about cheap flights because luckily these house shares you said they're free, but say if you want to go somewhere in Europe. What's the best way from someone living in Kent as the centre point to get around cheaply? So it depends where you want to go. If you want to stay in, like mainland England, I would just say National、um, Express is really good,、um, or just trains. But if you want to explore Europe, I would definitely, I would say flight is the cheapest option. Honestly, yeah. If you're really on a budget,、um, there are buses to. I don't know France. There are、um, night night buses. Yeah, those, from、yeah. London, and they could go as cheap as like five pounds, as I've heard. Yeah. Or、um, Eurostar as well. It could be cheap as well if you book in four months in advance. You could get tickets for like forty euros return from Paris. Yeah. To Paris. Wow. So. That's, yeah, Schedule that's ahead. Yeah. Cheaper flights. Che- yeah. Yeah.、Uh, in fact, there was.、Um, I don't know if you saw this story, but for the.、Um, it's a football story. Uh, and I'm going to try and dig up this article because it's a really interesting one. The Europa League final was in Baku in Azerbaijan, and there were no direct flights on the day of the final. 
and but both of the two teams playing were both English clubs, so people had to get from London to Baku, and there was a um, a father son duo who travel a lot together, and they put together on BBC News. Uh, but I'll try and dig up the article. A how the the cheapest way to get across, and basically all of it is like a train here, night bus. And all of them are like little 20, 30 pounds spend here and there, but they take like 13 mm. hours ago. And the cheapest way to do it took about five days. But, wow. Uh, if you want a super hard challenge, uh, now that the Europa League final's over, that would be interesting to try. But um, I don't know if you saw that story. Yeah, I, I also saw another one where um, these group of lads, they wanted to watch a football match in Spain. Yeah, and all the flights were five hundred pounds, so they actually drove all the way there. Oh, is that this like super cheap car that went all the <laughs> yeah, way? Yeah, exactly. But then you've got to factor in the days where you have to sp- spend in hotels as well, yeah. and uh, um, we'll food costs. As well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we'll stay in the car. Well, yeah, I think what um, they recommended for the Baku trip was basically sleep on the night trains mm. because the the night trains are about ten hours anyway, wow. and I think even the cheapest route was three days there, three days back. So for 90 minutes of football, which was absolutely crazy. And that's, that final was organized in a strange way. And that's its own other topic. <laughs> Dedication. Yes, of oh, the, the fans that actually made it there. Uh, and if your team loses, that's just horrible mm. because you've traveled three days minimum. Indeed. And spent hundreds, if not thousands, probably thousands to get there. Um, there were only a, cu- a couple thousand who even made it, I think. Uh, wow. Maybe even just one, one or two thousand from London. Which is, yeah, admirable. But that's its own a little adventure. Um, yeah, just now to tease the next few topics we've got coming off. We talked about trains. We're getting a train driver on the show. Stephen, call him Train Steve. He's going to be talking about trains and the work he does. We've also got Eleanor. She's going to be on the next show. She's the one talking about acting and theatre. Uh, she's been on stage recently. She's got some upcoming performances all in the Kent area. And we've got a returning guest. First podcast episode with Dan Inwood. He is back on the show, ready to talk about life-changing moments. We're going to be getting back our first guest on the show. Very excited to hear from him again and what he has to say. So now we're going to be going to Mike again in just a moment to wrap up this week's episode about solo traveling. But there are future topics we're still looking for people to talk about. So if you have a story to tell us about meditation get in touch. Maybe this can be Mike's next one. Maybe you've meditated or do yoga. Get in touch. We want to hear your story. We also need a guest to talk about poetry and language. If you're a poet or a writer, do get in touch. What do you write? We've had a playwright on the show. That was episode four. But we want to cover all other types of writing that you do. Maybe you, like Mike, take notes on trips and travel and have them all stored up. What writing do you do? Let us know. Contact at the My Generation Podcast on Facebook or links in the YouTube description. My email is also there. And if you're between the ages of 18 to 30 and live in camp, we want to hear your story on the show. So now to conclude this week's episode with Mike, Mike, what would you say has been the main takeaway from today's show if you had to sum it up in a sentence or two for the listeners? So if you want to travel, I would just say... Don't listen to your insecurities and fears. I would just say, just do it. If it's been honestly inside of you and you have that willingness to just do it, but something is holding you back, I would just say, book the ticket and you have no excuse to not go. Yeah. And would you say travel is for everyone? 100%. Um, I would honestly say, now I've graduated, I've learned much more from traveling than university in terms of life skills and people skills honestly well thank you so much for coming on and talking about that mike thanks for having max no problem well it's been a great show and great to hear some interesting different stories in fact emma who we had on she'll have been back now from a trip to india she was doing so everyone on the my generation podcast based in kent is going global at the moment and obviously also do get in touch if you have actually done this if you're solo traveling if mike's inspired you or you were doing so anyway let us know. We want to include sound bites from your trips. Include the ambience of wherever you're staying. We want to also change up the podcast, maybe do some episodes outside. So if you want that as well, let us know in the comments. We're willing to shape and change the podcast to however you would like to listen. And Mike, will we be able to get you back on the show in the future? Definitely, definitely. Um, but quick announcement, I am leaving England. <gasps> 
Da, da, da. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm moving to um, Shanghai next month. Wow, yeah. fair enough. And that's a permanent move. Yeah, to um, carry on my e-commerce venture. Yeah, so we, we've caught Mike right in his last month in Kent. Wow, well, good luck to all your pastures new in Shanghai. And, well, has that all come about from your year out in Hong Kong, just to finish? Um, no, it was from just my e-commerce sort of side hustle and it's turned into a f- essentially my full-time job after graduation now Wow! Um, because I'll be based in China where all the manufacturers are um, I'll be in the center point of where it all happens so yeah. yeah so a brand new life that started for Mike post-graduation all spirited by couch surfing what a great story thank you for coming on Mike and if we do have him on it'll be from Shanghai <laughs> Thank you, Mike. And yeah, to come, we've still got Trains with Stephen, which won't get you to Shanghai from Kent. We have Acting with Eleanor and The Return of Daniel Inwood. Thank you for listening, everyone. And we'll look forward to hearing from you again next week on the My Generation podcast.